I'm going to lay less now. It's good. Um, <laughs> now I need to set up. <laughs> I've gone through some changes. <laughs> uh, it's a very display. Yeah. Yeah, because we just yeah. dare to be, we dare to be different. Mm -hmm. oh, there is. So. I'm not an Apple user. So enough said. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're all set. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what? Okay, now I'm lost. Just tap. <laughs> just punch. Uh, so you just. Uh, well, you just do this. I have to do that every time? Yes. Okay. Oh no, you can just hit the top. Yeah, you're right. You're going to see the space. <laughs> the space? Okay. <laughs> Hello. Um, so, over the next three and a half hours, I'm going to take you through the bodies of work that have led me to this thesis proposal. And my timeline is not linear. Um, so this is a piece of work that I did in my undergrad. My grandfather passed away in February of 2016 from congenital heart failure. He was 85, um, and this was the first time I'd witnessed a hospice experience. And if you don't know what that is, it's um, for people who are terminally ill where they can be in their home and experience like... Um, a nurse come in and deal with pain medication, hygiene, and make sure that the person is comfortable during their last days. Um, so this was work that I had done, am I yelling? Okay. This was work that I had done to sort of deal with his death and that experience. Um, so these are 36 by 24 black and white photos, which I painted on, and they were all shown together. Um, and each photo was uh, selected from a different decade in his life. So two years later, halfway through grad school, um, I felt compelled to revisit this body of work, and I used one of the photographs that I had um, used before to create a pleather quilt, and I then upholstered it to a van seat, um, because this processing of my grandfather's death and the grief was still is a long journey. Um, but the co connection between myself and my grandfather is evident in the craft-based process of quilting as well as the upholstered van seat because he was like a wicked car guy. Um, so prior, in between those last two slides, um, timeline-wise, I created this piece which um, consisted of eight embroidered flower sack tea towels um, and the images were in the same high contrast black and white style from my grandfather's series, um, but the images were curated from a collection of senior portraits that my grandmother had had. And um, these, this like cache of photos she had was discovered in the house um, after my grandfather died and we were cleaning everything out. Um, so the portraits are of my grandmother, a few of her cousins, some family friends, um, but they're all women. And, the napkins are paired with some heirloom, heirloom, milk glass, um, table settings, and the tea towels were sort of like a documentation of the time period, the individual women, the craft of embroidery. Um, and at the time I knew there was like something else that I was trying to get at, but I was missing it. And at this point I'm thinking it was loss and family. Um, so in 2017, I created this piece, which consists of letters from my biological father embroidered onto bed sheets. Um, at the time, he and I had been estranged for a few years due to his abusive behavior towards myself and subsequently my son. Um, these letters were an attempt to reconcile after his suicide attempt, and I felt compelled to share these deeply personal letters as a way to alleviate myself from a sense of shame that inherently didn't belong to me. Um, in doing so, I made contact with a second cousin who shared her family struggles with me, and we were reunited and bonded in our realization that our family has some serious problems and it isn't our fault. Um, I hoped with this piece to use the getting at a feminist cliche of making the private public um, with the intent of inspiring others not to keep the burdens a secret. And I was pleasantly, uh, pleasantly surprised to realize that it worked, even if it might have only ever been one person. Um, 2018, 
This is an installation in an empty room in my grandmother's house. So after my grandfather died, the family cleaned their house out in preparation to sell. My grandmother bought a house in Florida and was ready to move on. Six months later, she decided she hated Florida and moved back to Maine. She sold the Florida house and she's now living in this unsold Maine house. Um, and the house is ex completely empty except for staged furniture. So it's super weird. Um, and it feels weird being in there and having these empty rooms which used to be filled with furniture and all this stuff, it's just, it's jarring. Um, so I made this installation as a way to fill the space um, and remind myself and my grandmother that even though the stuff isn't there and my grandfather isn't there, the memories still are and we can share that. Um, I was inspired by Woman House when creating this piece. Woman House was the first public exhibition of feminist art in 1972. Um, at the time of installing this piece, I was thinking about my close relationship with my grandmother and our shared loss. So this past semester, like my work has taken a visual shift um, and it's turned towards the specific family members in my female bloodline. Um, at this point in my work, I'm, you know, trying to get my thesis together, um, but I'm also inspired to work out another death in my family. Um, this July, we lost my stepdad to lung cancer, and he'd been married to my mom since I was about two years old. So the nature of the word stepdad um, isn't as removed and distant for me as it might be for other people. Um, I started working on a project about his death in a really similar way that I had done when my grandfather had passed, but it didn't really feel right. I kept making work about men in my life or men who were no longer in my life. And there was this tension between um, the drive to like enhance the value of women in art and this like feminism button that I have in my brain or whatever. Um, so to fix this tension, my perspective shifted to focusing on the women in my family who are still alive. So my mom and my grandmother. And it pursued me not so much in an art sense, but in a personal sense to m keep those connections strong and, and deepen them, um, which led to my genealogical work. Uh, these images here are wedding photos of myself, my mom, my grandmother, and my great-grandmother. Um, the choice of the wedding photo isn't an interest so much in the wedding itself, but it's a more reliable photo document the further back in history that I'm pursuing. So now this, my work is like super linked with genealogical work and um, much like, uh, well, basically as far as documentation goes, births, deaths, marriages are primary documents um, for creating a timeline. So, in my frustration of my lack of discovery of information about my female bloodline, I've obscured these images. Um, and much, much like the obfuscation of the lives of my like, lady ancestors. Um, so these images were inverted and printed as large scale negatives, which I used in a cyanotype process. So this is some of the work that I've created from those images. Um, I became more interested in pursuing this female bloodline after I inherited this box of genealogical papers from my grandmother and each piece was um, a visual, each piece here was like a visual and material exploration into that bloodline and leading towards a developing thesis topic. Um, I used the obscured negatives from the previous slide to create the 2D images um, and I also use the unobscured images as film to create the, cyan the cyanotype blanket. And the images were not inverted into negative as film, but they were inverted into negative on the cyanotype, um, obscuring them in a different way. So some new stuff, this is back at grandma's house. Um, these are 24 by 36 cyanotype prints of my mother, grandmother, great grandmother, um, the wedding photos, um, also the next generation will help her. Um, but much like the big yellow yarn installation, this is in an empty room at my grandmother's house. This was my mom's room growing up. It was my grandmother's sewing room. And again, I inherited all of her sewing stuff. Um, and in going through that, I was starting to see 
scraps of paper with old measurements from when we were kids, when my mom was a kid, when she used to sew. And like, I was thinking about the like little documents that are missing. These like documents that were almost exclusive to women that aren't, you know, on ancestry.com or whatever, but these little pieces of information started to pop up. So an artist I've been looking at is Linda Nagler. She's an Italian artist um, and she works in, uh, she collects old found photographs and exhibits them together as documentation. Um, so in looking at her work, she sort of put into perspective the notions of archiving and documentation as art, um, which was tying in with my genealogical work. Um, and I saw this great connection with that specifically, but then looking back and reflecting on my own work, I'm seeing that there's a connection in that my own work is documentation. I'm not telling a story, I'm recording time and history. Um, so that's sort of how I've been seeing all of this stuff, all the previous slides. These are just points in time that I've documented in a different way. So this is my studio wall. <coughs> Looks like a crazy person's in there, but I had to put it up visually to help me get a better handle on this timeline that I'm pursuing. Um, so in digging into the female bloodline, I obviously hit a dead end because um, once you aren't looking for male last names, it's very, very difficult. Um, so after four or five weeks of just straight digging and not sleeping, I found my fifth great grandmother and I'm 90% confident that I found her ancestral bloodline. And if I'm right, it leads back to 1505 Rhone, France. Um, so I'm, I, you know, I built this thing on my studio wall to help me visually look at what I'm doing, but also using the documents to fill in the blanks to try to, you know, try to piece together a woman's life in this timeline, but also putting in some of the work that I've done to sort of document this process. Um, so I don't really know what my piece will look like yet for this thesis exhibition. I'm okay with that. Um, I've got a little bit of time, but um, I'm leaning more towards, I'm still making and experimenting with the photography and the photos of my grandmothers are, um, they go back for, to my fourth great grandmother. So I'm very fortunate to have those photographs and that's what's fueling me right now, which leads me to my big wordy thesis statement. <laughs> the only slide I will read to you. Um, challenging patriarchal archival notions of Western genealogy, exploring the matrilineal line through autoethnography, traditionally gendered crafts, and alternative photo processes, illuminates and reframes personal history and definitions of the self through a feminist and interpersonal lens. <laughs> 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 so um, I also have a timeline, but like it seems, is this touch screen? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I have touch screen, but I don't have Apple. I'm gonna go back to this. So I'm done, but I want you to like really look at this. Because <laughs> I have a feeling these are where the question's gonna be at. <laughs> No questions. Good night. <laughs> I think it's interesting how you've also been pursuing simultaneously the digital curation. Um, and so I'm wondering about the relationship to that and archiving to this. And the other thing that I was thinking about is that you um, are documenting a woman's life, as you put it. And so on a timeline in your studio. And can you say at this point that that gives you any kind of uh, statement about a more general statement about women by examining this timeline? Can you say, infer something um, more 
to use Reed's term, universal. Um, and, 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 and the whole digital curation thing seems really interesting to ask you about. Okay. That's it. Um, that was loaded. Um, so, yes. Um, no, so the digital curation part is huge in this. Um, using the archiving um, has become crucial only because in doing the genealogical work, it hadn't really become part of my art practice. It was just something that like, oh, I'm that person in the family, so I have to do this. Um, and in taking the digital curation classes, I've basically been able to come up with my own digital database of the stuff if I chose to, but that's not necessarily what I would be doing. Um, but it has helped me think about how um, it has helped me reframe how I look at my work in a non-narrative way. And I think that's important because a lot of my work is so personal to me, but has these weird pockets of family in them that would almost imply there is a narrative. And, and in some of them, I'm giving you a narrative about why I made it. But I think what is important is that there isn't a narrative. And... Because there's. Why is it important? I think it's important that there is no narrative because of the nature of what I think narrative is. I, I mean, I'm not writing books. I'm not a writer, and I'm not. I'm not out to tell a story. I'm not setting out to do those things. And I think inherently, as people, we put narratives onto things, and regardless of, I mean, unless I flat out write a book in the structure of a book, traditionally, um, that's not what I'm doing. And I can't stop people from putting that narrative on things. So I, I, I think there's more of like. Um, I don't know if it's like, maybe it's just part of who I am. I think it's important that this documentation is, I don't know, maybe that's not a question I can answer right now. <laughs> I've got the mic, so I'm next, Ayla. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, there's some interesting relations that are traditionally thought of as oppositions in what I hear you talking about. Things like public and private, clear and opaque, known and unknown. And I'm calling them relations because I don't see them as opposites in your work. I see them as frames or spectrums. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm curious about those and maybe other things that you have in mind. And so how do these set of relations set in motion or bring up or create relationships between you and the people who look at your work or your audience? Hmm. Um, that's tricky because I, I don't like to think so much about my audience. I think I have to because of the nature of an academic program. Um, I, I think I try to keep myself out of it as much as possible for making work about myself. Um, there's like a little voyeurism in it, but... <laughs> Maybe that's part of it. Maybe that's another relation. I'll have to think about that more. I mean, I'm, I'm asking about it because I think if you begin to look at those traditional quote unquote oppositions, right, and one of those oppositions is between artist and audience, mm -hmm. then I think you can begin to get a hold of some things that might be very useful for you, right, to look at them as relationships, not as oppositions, things mm -hmm. that are connected, even though tr they're traditionally seen as disconnected. Okay, I'll do that. A scathing email later. Yeah. Oh my. <laughs> so I have maybe not a question, but like two comments uh, that I think like maybe, I don't know, might be useful, might be not. Uh, one of the things just like from talking with you about like when we ramble about this random stuff, uh, you have a very strong affection on like knowing the truth. 
So like finding out a tip, finding out like something that will lead you to like something bigger, like that kind of a realization. Um, which is something that is showing up in here because you yet have an affection or uh, how to explain it, like kind of an obsession of like figuring out like this entire, uh, this, like your entire like neology, right? Um, so that's one of the things to, to think about because you said like, you know, you're trying not to make the work about you but yet you're feeling like this very specific aspect of you as a person. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing uh, that is, comes a lot in your work, um, even though you know it follows the characteristics of like you know feminist art, you know like uh, opening up the private. It's still, you have this um, not find a better way to describe it concept of anti art, like against any like galleristic impos imposition of like you know don't touch the work, don't sit on the work, don't eat the work. <laughs> Yet you do all of these things um, that push you know, push like the viewer to kind of see it as mundane. Um, and yet the, sub the subject matter is like so deeply intertwined into like family history. Um, but yet it's just portrayed to the viewer as something that is not truly memorializing. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm getting at. Um, so that's something that just comes up and yet like I, I always find it really interesting about the work you do. Because mm -hmm. sometimes it's just like, it's crazy, like some of the stuff that you do, but yet, like when I find out like who the person is, I'm like, oh crap! Like I feel really bad that I ended up <laughs> doing these things, like these I objects. Sat on your yeah, grandfather. I, like, when I sat on your father, for <laughs> example. Um, <laughs> so that's something just to think about, because um, it's something that is truly interesting, and it's something that I always find like um, very uh, appealing about your work. Mm. Cool. Thanks. These students, God. <laughs> I need to de the computer. Right? <laughs> Never de you broke it. <laughs> Wait, give me a second. Uh...